Welcome to the TTS Talking Early Years podcast. Each week, we'll be joined by educational experts from across the globe, offering exclusive insights, inspiration, and guidance to help practitioners unlock the potential for learning in the early years. Hello, my name is Ruth Lequee, your host for this week's TTS Talking Early Years podcast. I'm an educational consultant, also known as my Mummy teacher, founder of MMGK, and I'm passionate about inclusion and play within the early years. Throughout this series, we're going to be discussing a range of topics aimed at supporting STEM in the early years, inspiring you with guidance and resources to enhance your practice. I'm delighted to introduce Shadi Vaziri as today's guest. Welcome to the podcast. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you, Ruth. How are you? I'm absolutely fine, thank you. I had a great time chatting to you on the last episode and I'm really excited to delve in again a little bit more. If our listeners didn't manage to catch last episode, could you please just give them a quick introduction about yourself? Yeah, sure. Like Ruth said, I'm Shadi Vaziri. I'm the founder of Early Years on a Shoestring, which is a platform to support practitioners to provide excellent education for early years children on a shoestring because we don't have those um, massive budgets as we used to do anymore. Um, so that's where Early Years on a Shoestring kind of started. And now it's it's transforming a little bit. And I'm really passionate about inclusive environments and supporting children with additional needs. And that's what brings me here today. Absolutely. I'm so excited for this. And in this episode, we're going to be focusing on inside the classroom and building strategies to create an inclusive indoor environment. And I think with this, we're obviously going to go into this a lot more and there's so much that you could unpack. It's really hard to do in a really short podcast. So we'll try and focus on the main things. But I always have in my in the back of my mind that everything that I'm putting in place is actually going to benefit all my children but it's essential for those children that need it. And I and I truly do believe when you put some of the things in place that we're going to talk about, these strategies that make it an inclusive environment, all children do do better. They all thrive better. They feel safer. They feel more included. They are more included and they can access the provision and, and in the way that they should be able to do. So I think everything that we talk about, put in your classroom whether you think you need it or not because that's essentially yeah, going to be the, the key to this so what do we mean when we talk about an inclusive classroom design have you got any thoughts on that so when we're thinking indoor classroom specifically we really need to think about our children that and that can change in each cohort and over each year and think about what do these children specifically need in order to become independent learners in this classroom so if you've constantly got children saying Shadi can you get me the glue or I can't find this or where's that or can you help me reach that that's not an inclusive classroom we want the children to be able to access the environment independently obviously safely so we're not going to put things high up for them to access but independently so they can really develop that learning journey of whatever they're thinking to do next so if we're thinking about the creative area we really need to be um a, are letting them access the scissors independently, the glue, paints perhaps, um, any sellotape or masking tape, but also to be able to then pack that away independently. So when we're talking about enabling environments, yes, it does include having those labels, not just those labels, but it does include having those labels. So having a photograph of the object and the word so that we've also got that challenge there for children who are able to apply their phonic knowledge. But having that photograph there, so if I'm not ready to apply my phonic knowledge, then I know exactly that the sellotape needs to go back into this spot. So making sure that the environment is inclusive, but that they can access that independently um and also suggest thinking about if there are routines or um actions that the children need to take in the environment have you got those visuals there and if an adult isn't in the environment or in that area of learning can the children still access that so it could be how we wash our hands something as simple as how we wash our hands so turn the tap on and there'll be a photograph or a picture turn the tap on wet our hands soak count to 20 while we're, we're washing our hands then put our hands back under the faucet and then so each and individual step is there in an icon or a photograph for the children to be able to follow so that if the practitioner or educator isn't there then they are still able to 
wash their hands or blow their, blow their nose if you've got a self-care station. So really enabling your children to access that and to, and to think about their self-care independently without you. If you're there, fantastic. You can have those conversations, you can ask those questions, but if you're not there, we want the children to still be able to access that space or that activity. Amazing. I think that leads on really nicely to thinking about the furniture and the physical set of the, the, the classroom as well. So you obviously just mentioned washing hands and having those really key visuals there. But it's also things like having having a step there that's the appropriate height for children to be able to access if they need. And then thinking within the classroom as well, the heights of the furniture. So there's nothing worse than when you go in and, you know, this is perhaps is sort of more key stage one. But when they've got tables that are a certain height and the chairs don't fit, so children are actually working on tables that aren't the right size for them we don't really like mentioning the word tables and chairs in relation to early years but it was just the example that came to my the top of my head um, and making sure that the room the way that your gorgeous play stuff your loose part everything is set up is easy to navigate especially for those children that have perhaps got physical needs or sensory needs are they able to get to go and to access the glue sticks physically get there and um, because we might have created an area that actually isn't accessible for them and then straight away it's not inclusive and it's something we touched on on the first episode of yes you might set up your classroom in september in a particular way and absolutely that's what you should be doing but it's about now sitting back reflecting looking around and thinking oh can Shadi access that area effectively? Or is she having to struggle or ask an adults to support? Hmm. Reese over there with her friends, but maybe that area is a little bit too small and I need to open that space up a little bit. Don't be afraid. Less is more. And this is something that's going to be threaded through, through these episodes. Less is more. Even if you then build up to adding more things in, strip it back. Allow the children to have that space and freedom and not too much clutter so that they are able to access that learning really, really effectively. And of course, we need to think about children who may be in wheelchairs or have mobility um, difficulties or challenges. And actually thinking about, it's really nice to have this piece of furniture here, but actually if I put it there, they're not able to go around um, and access it independently and, and easily. So really thinking that the classrooms are the children's spaces, although we spend most of our lives in them as well, they are really the children's space. And actually, we need to make sure that they can access that really effectively and independently. Mm -hmm. And I think as I'm thinking about that classroom design, one of the things we've just mentioned that's come into my head is that idea of flexibility thinking about the design, thinking about the furniture, but also thinking about our, the expectations of our children. And I would say being completely flexible to how that child needs to be on that day. So for some children, they might be able to sit on the carpet the way that we traditionally expect. But for other children, actually, that is not going to be meeting their needs. And they might need to just be on their stomach that day, or they might need to be relaxing on a beanbag that day, or However it is, they might need to sit with their knees up and have a little rock to sort of send, to soothe, to regulate. So part of your in inclusive classroom design is being okay with the fact that the children can be flexible just as much as the environment around them. Would you agree with that? Yeah. And taking your carpet example, you know, there's lots of different rhymes about sitting cross-legged and things. But actually, you're right. It's really uncomfortable for some children. Developmentally, it's not right for some children. And actually, what we want is the children to be engaged in what we're saying, what we're teaching them. OK, so if that means that Shardy's at the back of the, the carpet on a chair or Ruth sitting, like you said, on a beanbag or someone's at the back on their knees or on their stomachs or with their legs to one side, does it really matter if they're engaged? I also want to touch on when we're talking about this eye contact. So for some children, eye contact is a really difficult thing. Even for me sometimes, if someone's staring at me like this, it's really uncomfortable. <laughs> and actually, I'm still listening, even if I'm doodling on my page. And we, you know, we had a staff insert example in the last episode. Even if I'm doodling and not looking at you, or if I'm fiddling with my fidget, which I sometimes do, it, I'm still listening to what you're what you're saying or what you're sharing with me. And we need to apply that to our children. So if they're not giving you eye contact, 
it's fine. They are probably still engaging in what you're you're saying. Some children in the beginning of the day might not be ready to come straight over to the carpet. That's okay too. They might be pottering in a corner, playing with a puzzle. It's likely they're still engaging in what you're saying, but they're just not ready to come and sit on the carpet. So I think flexibility is key for all of our children. But like we're saying, particularly for children with additional needs, that flexibility is really key. And also having the understanding that on Monday, this might work for Shadi, but by Wednesday, it's not working anymore. I need to, you know, change it up a little bit and see. There are lots of different things that influence our, our child's behaviour and regulation. It could be they haven't slept the night before. It could be that they were staying at their mum's the night before and it's different from staying at their dad's. It could be that the alarm didn't go off and they were rushing this morning. They haven't had breakfast. We've really got to think about, again, the whole unique child and thinking, right, something's not right here. Let me speak to their grown up. What happened this morning on the way to school or did something happen on the way to school? Yeah, actually, the alarm didn't go off and then we missed the bus. And actually, I forgot to give her breakfast and all these things happened. OK, so Shadi might be coming into school now, not really ready to learn. So what we're going to do as a school and as, as educators is, OK, the first thing is to give her some breakfast. Give her that quiet time to relax and re-regulate and then she'll be ready to engage in that teaching and learning. And if you're worried about your timetable constraints and fitting in everything to phonics and all those schemes that we've got to think about these days, um, no matter what your personal views on them are, um, you can always pick up on phonics with her later in that day while she's doing her learning. She's not going to miss out. But if we kind of almost force her to be engaged in that moment after that really tricky morning, She's not going to listen or learn that anyway. So being flexible and, and knowing your children and being brave in saying, actually, this is not right for her right now. So I'm going to adapt it and I'll pick up with her later for phonics or whatever it is that I've got to teach her. So always going back to that unique child and thinking, what do these children, group of children or this child, what do they need now in this moment? feel safe and regulated and then ready to learn? Absolutely. I think you hit the nail on the head then, really. They're not going to learn anyway if their needs aren't met. We have to do the Maslow's before we can do the Blooms. We go back to it all the time. But I know when you're when you're in your setting, when there's that pressure, when you've got the pressure from above, this many children have got to get GLD, whatever it is, it can be so difficult. But I always say to practitioners, you are the one that is with those children. You know those children best. The most important thing is their well-being. And if we focus on those things, they will thrive better anyway. You're doing the best thing you can. That thing at that moment in time is more important than phonics, a hundred million percent. And and it's so important that we get those things there for them as well. What do you think about displays being sort of inclusive within our classroom? And I briefly want to touch on sort of representation and being mindful of that with our children that are within our early years platforms. So we've got to make sure that when that child walks into the classroom, they see themselves. So that, like you're suggesting, that could be the displays. So are there photos up of the children engaged in learning with that maybe perhaps speech bubbles of whatever happened that day? Are there family photos in the home corner or somewhere else that might make sense? Um, can the children see themselves in the text that you offer in your reading areas? Are the books diverse? Are, the, um, are they inclusive? Are your displays diverse and inclusive? The children need to feel like that is their classroom and that they can see themselves. So in your reading corner, if you've only got book books on offer that feature animals as main characters or only white children as main characters, that's not inclusive and that is not showing the children the diversity of our world. We've really got to think about, are we including everybody in our classroom and in our world? Um, the same thing with our displays. Are they really up high so the children can't, can't access them can't see them is it mainly those kind of teacher-led displays like i know you've got to have your phonics freezes up but is it mainly like working walls and phonics freezes and they and printed out kind of posters and things or can you really feel the child's learning journey or the children's learning journey within the displays if it's autumn have you got photographs of children going on an autumn walk and then bringing the leaves back and printing with them doing a bit of art or doing some color sorting or some counting with those leaves can you see the learning that's happened and can the children see themselves in that learning it's really important that we think again this is the children's classrooms 
does it reflect that? Mm, absolutely. And that's, it comes through the stories that we're reading as well, doesn't it? The books that are available for them in the, in the book corner. Um, are they showing children with, you know, a range of disabilities, different ethnicities, different cultures? And um, we want to be as inclusive as possible so every single child is represented, but also that we are challenging their norm that they're they're used to and we're providing that within the setting that we've got because all our settings will be so incredibly different dependent upon the catchment and we need to open our children up to to the different um you know different worlds that are outside the four walls of their little classroom as well how can we make a child feel included without feeling singled out or a, a big extra effort is needed for this child so I think we, we touched on this last episode, but we spoke a lot about ordinarily available uh, available provision. We said that possibly different boroughs or different parts of the UK might call it something different, but it's really that provision that you're putting in place that is just there. It's part of your kind of the the bread and butter of your school or setting. So that visual timetable we know that it's specifically to support perhaps Shardy and Ruth because they've got additional needs, but actually it's going to support the whole school. And it's not something that we single those children out and say, Shardy, come over and we'll do, and um, we'll look at the visual timetable in front of everybody. It's just something that you do to support that child. So thinking about the routines and maybe modeling behaviors so that everybody can really access that environment without having, um, perhaps a practitioner having to go over and support you with that because that hasn't been modelled to you. Modelling how to use an area of learning or some provision is really important so that um, you're not singling that child out. They're learning it with the class so that they can access that independently. Yeah, I love that. And I think we used to have this thing historically of like TA as being like Velcro to a particular child and it's sort of moving away from that so that the support that child needs is put in place so that that TA doesn't just have to be with that child because that child can access the provision. They've got the resources in place. They've got the additional things that they need to support them regardless um, yeah. as well. That's just a really great way to do. So I think we've had some great conversations there um, and thank you ever so much for all the points that you've put across. I think they'll be really, really useful for our listeners. Thank you, Ruth. I'd like to say a huge thank you to our guest, Shardy, for joining us and providing such valuable insights. You've been listening to the TTS Talking Early Years podcast with me, Ruth Lequee and Shardy Raziri. If you've been inspired by our conversation today, don't forget you can sign up via the link in our episode notes to be the first to hear about future episodes and access exclusive follow-up content including ideas for your settings and links to relevant resources. Thank you.